name is Michael Brown. I'm in the Department of History, and I share many of the vantage points that I've heard already about Wikipedia. So I will say that in spite of uh, protestations that I offer about not using kind of content, students inevitably do. <laughs> so it has to be reckoned with one way or another. And uh, I think we're in a moment of examining sources and the reliability of sources. So getting under the hood of the source upon which they all rely, at least as a first resort, I think is a valuable exercise for mm -hmm. that. You know, where the information on the internet that they're taking at face value comes from, how is it produced, who is responsible for it. Uh, so I'm interested in those kind of questions. I'm Gene Lilac. I work at NKID uh, Manage Teacher. And I'm interested in writing and how uh, Wikipedia, the writing in Wikipedia, the language is, uh, is, is very challenging. writer by the name of Manya Kamenetz. And in the article she wrote, writes, uh, Wikipedia has a bad rap in academic circles as the lazy students substitute for real research. Michael, my facilitation spider sense is tingling. Yeah. Um, in other summers, I teach uh, Wikipedia courses and I minutes and then I gotta go teach freshman writing. Um, I do not allow the students to go anywhere near Wikipedia. Um, cite it, I use it, refer to it, or touch it. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious how to, um, obviously they, they, they're drawn to it, that's the, that's the first hit that, that looks at them at the, on the page, right? The Google search. So um, I'm ready to be educated and then write to could it, is it okay if I ask a, que a quick question? So those of you that bar students from using Wikipedia, wh why? Like Elena or Kirsten or Michael, why do you say no, you can't use it? Um, what I think I try to get the students to is away from primitive answers on every level for any topic. I think primitive approaches, simplistic answers, um, Quick fixes is what they strive for, and so I'm 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 always trying to get them away from that and, and to open New York Times and, and see what it looks like and touch it and smell it or something. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just part of part of that. The the um, primitive approach to assignments, tasks, and questions. Okay. Any anybody want to add anything else? Um, Okay, so <laughs> Alina said that she is trying to get students away from quick fixes and primitive or simplistic approaches to understanding. Yeah. Well, say I often don't give them assignments that can be answered with Wikipedia level answers, which is maybe a similar issue. They could find out a couple things about it, but my task would be resolved by looking at Wikipedia. They have to dig into it. Um, I think I'm worried about. So there might be emphasis in a Wikipedia entry that would be what the scholars would emphasize right. if they were covering the same topic. Um, there might be uh, assertions in the Wikipedia entry that are presented uncontroversially, but they're the subject of great scholarly mm -hmm. controversy. And since it's that controversy itself, which I'm interested in inviting students to get into, um, I will steer them away. way in which it, it, it papers over controversies as though debates were ended, um, and the way it, it leaves some things out um, mm -hmm. on concerns that I have about particular pages that I've read, knowing that students have consulted them, um, found these problems. Okay. That's really helpful, because I think we can address some of these. Um, let's see. So. Uh, 
Michael said he's concerned that um, sometimes there's bias, particular biases in certain entries in Wikipedia, and that part of uh, it is that controversies between scholars or debates between scholars are not presented, um, or they're presented um, less than fully. Right? Is that a less than adequate summary, but a working summary? So, OK, so this project um, is the collaboration between Lara Nicosia and I. And we couldn't, I couldn't do it by myself. So um, one of uh, our goals today is to talk about the resources available through Lara and Kari and other Wallace Center staff who can help faculty work on a Wikipedia-based project, but on other innovative um, approaches as well. And also, I'm going to tell you about the support available through the Wikimedia Foundation, so external to RIT. And I should say that in, in assigning this project, my students are not citing Wikipedia as a source. They're actually contributing entries or improving existing entries. So they are doing research using the New York Times, using the Journal of American History, using um, you know, typical uh, what we would consider scholarly sources, um, and making that information available to others. So very briefly, I, when I came here, you know, I, I was trained as a scholar of women's and gender history. I wind up at RIT with a 75% male student body and like no history major. So it was, I, it was strange. It was a strange place to be. And I was trying to figure out how to create assignments that would be of interest to my general education students. Um, because the papers I was getting were like not good just really not good and sometimes plagiarized. Um, so not only not good, but leading to academic conduct hearings, which you know you don't want that. <laughs> so <laughs> I was lucky enough to take a seminar with David Martins that was held in this room, actually. So having a little bit of memory of that seminar um, about te teaching write of in writing intensive courses and strategies for teaching writing across the disciplines. And um, as part of that class, David said, go read whatever you want to read and report back on it. And I said, thanks, David. You've inspired me to read <laughs> writing history in the digital age, um, which is available through the University of Michigan Press. So you can get it through the library, but it's also for free um, through their digital humanities series. And in this, there's several articles by historians who had started to use Wikipedia in their courses. And they shared some of the same skepticism that you all have this morning, or this afternoon, rather, about Wikipedia. But they also felt um, a need to uh, help students be able to read it critically. Um, they knew that it was going to be the first thing that comes up on their cell phone. And I've read surveys that suggest that the majority of historians use it themselves. Like, if, I'm, if I forget a date when I'm giving a lecture, I'll have a student look it up. And you know they'll look it up on Wikipedia. So I mean, it's in a way, we were being hypocritical, right? Because we were using it ourselves to get quick information. Um, and so I was inspired um, by this. Also, particularly as a women's historian, I was inspired because um, the majority of articles on Wikipedia are written by men about men. So women are underrepresented both as contributors and as subjects of entries. And so I thought, here's an opportunity for me teaching women's and gender history in a heavily male tech environment um, to try to make a difference. And um, I've found that students really respond well to this, in part because their work has a public audience. So they're not writing a research paper just for me. Um, everyone who has an internet connection can read what they write. And that has led to markedly better writing. And another um, insider tip is the community of editors on Wikipedia is amazingly vigilant. 
And so they actually go on and copy edit my students' entries, which means I don't have to <laughs> because there are people that are literally volunteering. And that also gives the students a little bit of real world um, feedback, whereas they might think, oh, it's just my professor being a perfectionist. It's like, no, there really are these grammatical standards that people will hold you to. And so that's been really <laughs> an unexpected benefit. Side benefit has been um, the editing that um, people do. OK, I'm going to turn it over to Lara. So just as a little bit of background, um, so Tamar had approached me that she had this idea for a class. I had never supported a Wikipedia project before. I'd only kind of dabbled with it kind of casually. Um, but I said I'd be happy to partner with her and working on trying to show the students how to edit Wikipedia as well as the research aspect behind it. Um, so in preparing for it, I had to do a little bit of research on Wikipedia myself and I learned some things. Um, if you're familiar with Wikipedia, you might already know some of this, but Wikipedia, everyone thinks of it as a free-for-all. And in some ways, it is, you know, it's open. Anybody can edit it. But there are some guiding principles in place. Um, so Wikipedia, first of all, establishes itself as an encyclopedia, which when I do do the class for Tamar, we just did one section this morning, I always remind students that, to me, that becomes one of the bigger challenges bigger reasons not to use Wikipedia, and you've all kind of touched on this a little bit, is it's not so much the idea that anybody can edit it, it's an encyclopedia. Basic encyclopedias are not designed for scholarly research of any form, whether it be a printed basic encyclopedia or Wikipedia. Um, ultimately, it's just a collection of kind of all the knowledge that already exists to kind of quickly give it back to you in a um, synthesized version. It's supposed to be written from a neutral point of view. The content is freely accessible to anybody um, who has an internet connection. Editors are meant to treat each other with respect and civility. And other than that, there are really no firm rules. Now, as you go into it, when you're creating content, there are some other rules in place. Like one rule is that um, all your information needs to be verifiable by a source outside of Wikipedia which I think is always also a good reminder for students that even Wikipedia says Wikipedia is not a good source of information. Um, but the takeaway from this is really that although there, it is something that anybody can edit, there are some general guidelines in place that have to um, be taken into account. The other thing that I learned in preparing for this, though, is that Wikipedia does have a lot of biases to the content. And Tamar touched on this a little bit. But according to some studies that have been done, the typical demographics for Wikipedia editors, majority tend to be male, aged 15 to 49. They're formally educated, white collar workers or students. They're English speakers, and they come from developed nations, mostly Christian nations. And the reason this is significant is because the content that's on Wikipedia is dictated by the people who are editing it. So these are the people who are determining what entries are being created on the system. And there's going to be a natural bias in what they select to invest their time in. Um, it also is going to impact how much time and energy is put into these entries because of, um, again, who's ultimately editing them. And what this leads to is a few different biases. One is the technical bias digital divide issue. So, as you look at the editing on Wikipedia, it is certainly um, manageable, but it's the type of thing that you do have to have a little bit of tech savvy to be able to easily work in the system. I always think to my you know, 85-year-old grandmother who, for 85, she does great with a computer. I don't foresee her editing a Wikipedia entry. Um, the other issue is stable internet access. So here um, in the US, and particularly areas like Rochester and RIT especially, we have access to a great robust internet network. But that is not the case around the world. Or even in the country, there are certain rural areas that don't have access or you know, poorer neighborhoods that maybe don't have that access. So you get a little bit of a divide that gets created in that way. Related to this, you end up with the first world bias of who's creating information. And this goes back, again, to the stable internet infrastructure, but also the luxury of free time. I mean, this is something that people tend to do. You know, they come home from work. They want to relax. This is the type of thing that they do. And um, you know, 
free time is a luxury of the first world in many ways. So there's a bias that gets created in that sense. And then, of course, the gender bias, which is kind of outlined by the demographics of the editors right here. The one thing, as I've done this a little bit, uh, a few more times with Tamar, the more I do it, I think about kind of the, the social responsibility that we in the first world have of improving the content on Wikipedia. Although here we you know, often say, don't use it. It's not a you know, legitimate resource, or not legitimate. It's not a, a scholarly resource that you might use in your classes. Um, in a lot of you know, third world and developing countries, they rely very heavily on the contents of Wikipedia. In certain places, you can actually download the entire contents of Wikipedia onto your phone so that if you don't have access to stable internet, you have this knowledge base that you can travel around with you. They're dependent on this information. So I always feel a little bit like there's, like I said, somewhat of a social responsibility for those of us who have access to great information and have the ability to improve this content, to make that content as good as we can make it. It's my little soapbox piece of this. Um, but with regards to Tamar's class, we focus a lot on the gender bias. There was a study in 2013, it looks like, that said that 16.1% of Wikipedia editors were female overall. Um, Wikipedia itself has tried to address this and has um, had some, made some efforts to address the bias that exists there. They acknowledge it, but they've also stated that not much has happened. The bias is still there regardless of the efforts they've made. It's still they don't have a formal count, but they're estimating it's still around this figure. Um, in the US, it's a little higher. 22.7% are female. Um, but there's also these lexical inequalities that exist, where entries about women tend to more heavily focus on topics such as family, relationships, gender, more so than entries on men. So it's not just a matter of content development. It's also the contents that's there has this gender-based bias. Jump in. Sure. So, um, so in my class, um, students have to either create a new biographical entry on a notable um, American woman, or add substantially to an existing biographical entry. Um, and those are not the only kind of entries. So, you know, for example, uh, a psychological theory can have an entry on it, or. Um, a, an artist, um, well, that would be a biographical entry, so sorry, Rebecca, that's a bad example, but it could be Impressionism as a school of art, for example. So, um, but for our purposes, so, so I have had students in the past, some of them have, have done and contributed to like entries on women in the American Revolution. That is more complicated, as Michael, um, Michael's earlier question intimated, because then you're getting at historiographical questions or debates among scholars. And since I'm teaching a 100-level course um, for, that is primarily gen ed, I find that doing the biographical entry works best. And it works best for all my students to do the same thing when possible. So if I have an exceptional student that is advanced and really wants to do a more historiographical um, based project on Wikipedia, I will work with them. But in general, plus, because over time, Lara has been able to, to advocate for adding some um, databases that are really good for biographical research to our subscriptions here at the Wallace Center, like American National Biography Online, which is a, a scholarly um, online um, source that Susan Ware, who's a, who's a historian, edits that I've contributed entries to and other scholars write entries to. So things, and, and women in social movements, so some of those databases that are particularly good for this assignment. So that's why, again, it's like so essential to work um, with one of the librarians here because they can help you figure out how to support the assignment best and make sure that we have the necessary resources. But so students have to write at least three substantial paragraphs using five new sources. But often students do more. So this student added about 3,000 words, 
which I think is, is pretty good for, you know, a hundred level um, course. Um, and and the, it's scaffolded. So we have training sessions with Lara at the beginning of the semester. Then we do, they have to submit um, a bibliography to me, a, to a topic in a bibliography, and I have to approve it. Then they do peer review in class. And then they come back, and Lara helps them move their draft entries from the sandbox, which is um, a, a, a place to draft entries, and then to move it live so that it can actually be seen by other people. Um, so that's so I think it works. You know, giving them basically the whole semester. So I have it. They have to finish it be right around the Thanksgiving break. And then that gives us a couple weeks to track how people receive it um, and what kinds of feedback they get. And they reflect on what the assignment has taught them. Um, maybe should I show the, um, the... So the nice thing is that um, I'll show you some other um, entries that students have worked on. So this, so this is through, so I have a course page. This is last year's, because my students just started this year. So this is a year ago. Um, and there were 30 students who added almost 21,000 words to Wikipedia. Um, and this is through the Wiki Education Foundation. So they'll create a course page for you. You contact this person, Helene Blumenthal. And she also will assign you a tech support person for each class, which is great because this doesn't happen a lot. But last year, I had one of my students had picked the same person as a student in another course. They were both trying to write about the same woman scientist. And so we needed to merge their two articles together. And so I just emailed Ian, and he got back within like four hours and had taken care of the problem. So I think especially because um, the Wiki Ed Foundation is aware of some of the biases, that's part of why they're especially keen to get college students involved. Also, they're trying to create future editors. So they really have a lot of um, services available and support. They have trainings. So my students do online trainings through their site. And um, the other thing that's really nice, let me see. This is extended. So OK. So I can see, um, I can see what each student did. I can see if they've, if they've done the training or not. So it makes it really easy to grade. And then um, <clears throat> if I want to see whoops, the characters that they've added, I can um, come down here, and it will show me. So everything that they did is highlighted. So that's how you can keep track of what your students did. And there's also a way to see this on without having a course page. You can see the history of edits on any Wikipedia entry. But I find this the fastest way for grading is to go through the Wiki Ed Education Foundation. Um, and it helps me see you know, what, what did the students do um, and you know, how um, did, they, did they include appropriate sources and everything. So that's a way that I'm able to assess their work. Um, I wanted to show you. Sometimes they go, they get really excited. I had a student who's from Auburn who went and took um, photographs of historic homes, including Harriet Tubman's, and added, actually uploaded the pictures to Wikimedia Commons and then put them on her entry. Um, I had a student who wrote 7,000 words. So I mean, some of them do the bare minimum, but a lot of them get really excited about this and um, have told me that they really enjoy the assignment and, and feel like it's meaningful. Um, and it's encouraging them to see themselves as contributors to um, you know, an, an educated community, to see themselves as a peer. They're being treated as peers because they're being edited. Uh, by um, anonymous editors who just volunteer because they're passionate about Wikipedia. Um, so that's been really good. 
I guess I would say one of the only challenges, because Rebecca, you brought this up, um, is uh, working with the archives. So one thing is for verifiability, Wikipedia really prefers published sources. And so I had a student who wrote about a, um, a deaf individual whose records were here in NTID archives. And that entry got deleted because Wikipedia editors argued that this person wasn't notable because their name wasn't published anywhere, right? Um, and, and so this is the way in which Wikipedia does replicate biases such as um, you know, bias against disabled individuals um, who tend to be underrepresented in print media already. So it was difficult. And I did um, engage with the editors in discussion about this, but we didn't really win in the end. And so that made the students sad. I think it also was an informative lesson about the politics of knowledge construction. Um, but I try, to, I try to give my students warning now and tell them, you know, you really, not that you can't work with the NTID archives, but if you're going to do that, you have to select someone who's in there who somehow also had an obit published in the New York Times or had an obit published, you know, maybe they went to Gallaudet and somehow they, there's some uh, public, publicly available you know, newspaper or other, other printed source that mentions them. So that's a little bit tricky. And standards of notability tend to reproduce, you know, elitism, basically. Like wealthy people are more likely to have, you know, um, male individuals, white people, and, and able bodied people. Um, so that's something that we talk about, and I think it's a good learning um, opportunity for students. Um, it also, you know, they often want to cite just like any website that they've found. And so it's a good um, exercise for us to talk about what is a reliable source and to try to differentiate different um, website, web-based um, sources of information. I don't know how many of you saw the Stanford History Group's report last year that surveyed um, college students as well as high school students and tried to see how many of them could discern, among other questions, sponsored content from non-sponsored content on websites. It turns out the majority of college students could not identify sponsored content. Um, so they really, you know, they're, they're considered to be, um, oh, what's the term? Digital natives, right? But they um, actually really need help in, in, in enhancing their digital literacy and in um, being able to differentiate different kinds of information online. So I think this is, that wasn't my goal when I started the project, but it's, be it's increased in importance, and then especially also in, in reference to something Michael Brown said earlier, you know, to the proliferation of fake news um, makes it even more important for our students to be able to look for reliable sources of, of information online. Um, so I think that teaching with Wikipedia can have a lot of different benefits um, in the classroom. That doesn't mean it's necessarily for everyone. Um, but if you want to try it out, um, Laura, do you want to tell them a little bit about some of the resources you've developed? Sure. Because in addition to what Wikimedia has, Lara has developed all this stuff. So like Christine, I don't code at all, and I don't, I don't get involved in any of this part. Lara handles it all. So I mean, I engage with them about the quality of the sources they're selecting. I copy edit some of their, I try to get them to do peer review, but I will copy edit as needed. Um, so I'm engaging with them on the more traditional writing and research part. But Lara really is the person who teaches them the technical aspects. Right. So just before I jump, jump into that, I'll just comment. Um, one of the reasons I really enjoy doing this assignment for Tamar's class is I always feel like um, from my conversations with students when they come to meet with me about research assignments they have, 
they don't necessarily always understand that what they're saying is contributing to the conversation on something. They tend to think that they need to just spit back what somebody else has already said because they don't see that their voice has value in the conversation. And I think this is an assignment where they can very readily see what they're saying has now just actually contributed to it because they see right away that what they've done has now just been published for the whole world to see on that particular topic. So I find it really um, meaningful for them in that way. But with regards to the class, um, we have basically the way we have it structured at the moment is um, the class comes to meet with me two times at the beginning of the semester. So I just met with her class this morning. And today's focus was on Wikipedia as a tool. So I focus, I talk a little bit about the bias, some of the rules. I go into a little more detail than I did today. Things to think about, what makes a good entry, stuff like that. And then um, at the end, they set up an account and they create a sandbox. And um, time allowing, we go a little bit into some of the basic editing aspects of the Wikipedia entries where they can kind of play in their sandbox. Um, and then kind of we've learned as it's gone on that the first time we did it, we just had them play in the sandbox and that was it. But then when it came time for them to actually write their entries, they'd either forgotten or were still confused about things. So the first assignment they have is after the class, they have to create a fictional biography in their sandbox. Um, I try to emphasize it's not about the content. It's all about the editing. So I always have Peter Penguin. I like penguins. And Peter Penguin went to University of Antarctica and really likes fish and stuff like that. Really silly entry. Didn't put any thought really into the content behind it. It was more about playing with the different wiki markup for them. And I have created, and I can show you um, for the class, the library has this research guide system that we use, that I use for some of the classes. And underneath Wikipedia resources, um, there's a lot on here. I go through it with them. But I give them this basic template that they can copy and paste into their sandbox to get them started. And they basically have to change everything that's in red. And this will make a basic biographical entry if you were doing it for a living person. The only difference for a deceased person would be how you do the birth date and the death date. But it at least gives them kind of the basics for getting started. Then the second class, they meet with me, and we do a typical library research assignment. Because even if they've done research before, you know, biographical research is going to be different than something they might be accustomed to. So I go through the different resources we have for that. And at the end of that, they need to go and find an entry and add um, a further reading. So further reading on Wikipedia entries are basically other books that are on the topic that aren't necessarily cited in the body of the entry. So um, I, we had an event, so I have laminated Wikipedia entries. Um, you can see the further reading kind of comes down toward the bottom. It's after the references. And it's just, in this case, a book or a journal article, something that they, you might want to consult if you wanted to know more about the topic. And that kind of gives them two experiences. One is adding a section to an entry, um, a live edit. The first thing in their sandbox is kind of you know, in the safety of their little sandbox. But now they're going to go out and make a live edit to something. And um, the second is they're applying what they've learned. They have to identify a source on this topic and add it to the list. Um, and the thing is with Wikipedia, it can be really nerve-wracking the first few times you edit it because everyone's going to see it. And you know, what if you mess something up? Um, so I think that having these kind of low stakes way for them to start editing, it makes you more comfortable. And then before you know it, you're adding all sorts of stuff. Um, I know for myself included, if I see like a minor mistake, I go in and edit it right away and I don't give it a second thought. And I think that's one of the positive outcomes of this assignment is that they're hopefully more comfortable in Wikipedia. So you know, five years from now, if they see something, they don't think twice about going in and correcting the information. Um, if they don't want to do the further reading, the other option is the info box, which on there is that box over on the right-hand side. You've seen it with the image and then kind of like the quick vital stats for it is another quick thing that can be added. And the content for the info box is completely derived from the entry itself. So again, it's about making that live edit that's you know, fairly low stakes to add without requiring an excessive amount of research just to kind of get them into the editing um, process. Let's see. Uh, OK. 
Um, and then this is, we had in the spring a Women on Wikipedia edit-a-thon, which was kind of applying these ideas of the class and taking them a little bit more broadly. Um, for Women's History for Month. For Women's History Month, right. <laughs> it was in March, and um, you can see we all have purple shirts and um, had a lot of fun. It was a day-long event, and same type of idea. We provided people with templates. We actually made a really lengthy list of women who needed further readings and suggestions because again it was more about getting people into the habit of actually going in and adding this content rather than asking people to do extensive research in that particular moment so that hopefully down the road they'll do a little bit more. We, we encourage them to, to to look at like the table of contents and you know to determine that it actually is related but not to read the whole book no. right and part of this ties into that follows my um, presentation on re find, doing research on the topic so when I talk about books I talk about looking at who the publisher of the information is you know looking at for university presses for example looking through the table of contents um, for indicators. So hopefully they've evaluated the source in that context before putting it on there. Um, so yeah. But I think, to me, one of the takeaways from this edit-a-thon and these practice examples for them is it, it's nice to have students you know, create new or edit existing entries, but there's even smaller things that they can do that's still kind of tying them into the conversation. And like I said, getting them to see that they are having an immediate impact on the information that's being presented um, without having to have an entire research paper size assignment. It can be stuff like adding the further reading, um, identifying references. That's what we used to have them do is they had to find uh, something and footnote it in the entry. Um, so I think there are other things to do. I mean, not necessarily, I don't think, for any of your areas here. But I've been to workshops on um, Wikipedia's class sessions where they've talked about having, you know, taking a Spanish Wikipedia entry and translating it to English. So I think there are ways to think about it other than just creating new entries. I think that was it on our slides. Uh, other comments or questions? Oh. Yeah. Right, they, they don't have to disclose their identity. So they have to create a Wikipedia account, but that doesn't have to be linked to their real name or their RIT username. You know, I tell them it can be, you know, pink cat seven or green soccer, soccer ball, whatever, so. Um, you know, some, some of the editors have maybe been a little bit harsh, like <laughs> characterizing the student's writing. Um, I don't think they were being unfairly harsh. And, and I, so I don't know. I mean, I probably would have been nicer in how I commented on the student's writing. But that's why I said I actually think it's a benefit for them to get some like real world because I don't know that their future employers are always going to be um, very, you know, encouraging in giving um, critical feedback on writing. May, you know, maybe they'll be lucky and they will be. But I do, I do warn them, like, you know, hey, like this is, you know, I, these are people that volunteer, and you know, if if your sentences are really badly written, then you're going to get called out on it. Yeah. Yeah. How do you go about assessing the contribution? And do you fold any of the editor feedback into your assessment? Um, I have not formally folded in any of their feedback into it. And I, I would say it's not that different. It's sort of like C is meets expectations. 
you know, B is better than, you know, exceeds expectations, and A is like, wow, this is really high quality work. So um, I, I think it's, it's actually not that different than grading like a research paper would be. Um, but I don't expect everyone to take the project and run with it. So I expect there to be, you know, somewhat of a variance. But the other thing is, like, they, get, they can get credit just for doing the trainings. They get credit for making the fictional. So they can earn a lot of points towards the final project, um, which is like 40% of their overall grade in the course. But it's, some of it is sort of just for showing up, you know, just for completing the assignments. So, um, so I think that can help students that are trying, you know, if, if they're at least making an effort, they get credit for that. Yeah. This, I mean, this assignment seems like it has you know, the focal point of an entire course and stand on its own. But it sounds like it's nested within a larger examination of women's history. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Michael. The question was like, is there a relationship, or do students see a relationship between the Wikipedia assignment and the course, which is a general survey of US women's and gender history from 1600 to present? Um, so we march along every week, and they do have an essay-based final exam. And yeah, students will. So some of them have written about birth control reformers and the topic of eugenics. and. You know, we also talk about Margaret Sanger, and, and um, uh, we have readings about the um, battles over establishing birth control. So they, they will often bring them, that up themselves. Um, and there's often an interest in local women's history related to the Underground Railroad or to the women's suffrage movement. And so um, we also cover that in the class. And so that's nice when there's that. Um, and I try to teach about women scientists and engineers anyway um, because of, you know, because people at RIT tend to be interested in that. And so um, sometimes they've um, been interested in, in um, women science scientists and have been able to to talk about the, the challenges they faced in their career that were related to them, to their gender. I've actually, I think it's had a big impact on male students um, who, who read about, you know, sometimes they get upset, like, oh, why haven't these women been recognized? Or why didn't I ever learn about this? And so um, the class is usually 50-50, like 50% male students and 50% female students. So. Um, it tends, it tends to be the women students that are the ones that I can remember that have like written the 7,000 words. And um, that was an entry on Annie Londonderry, who was the first woman to ride around the world on a bicycle. So <laughs> cool story. And <laughs> there's this young woman, computer science major, who happens to love mountain biking and just, and, you know, just fell in love with Annie Londonderry and wanted to write about her. So that was a great a great um, time, and I really enjoyed getting to know her. She came to office hours a lot to talk about it. Um, and so it's, I, I can't remember any male students that have you know, gotten quite as excited as that, but they have been very reflect, you know, reflective um, in their final essay, which asks them basically, what did you learn in the course of doing this project? And I think that's where some of them will reflect on knowledge construction and um, why it is that there's so little information about women on Wikipedia. We have a few more minutes. Other questions or comments? Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, some of it is already on that info guide that um, that is publicly available that um, Lara showed, um, because that has um, the best, best practices. Yeah, the manual of style. I lost the mouse. There's a manual of style that they have. They have templates. Right. This is how, and this is how they determine who's notable or not, um, and they describe, you know, like what the first paragraph should should do as an introductory paragraph. Um, so I haven't created like additional guides beyond what's here, um, and in terms of sources, Lara, like as Lara was saying, we've we've been in dialogue about this, and so. She um, t talks to them about university press publications, because I think that's important. Students have no idea what that means. So it's important that they understand that, that they understand what peer review is. Um, so Lara does that in the training, and then I kind of reinforce that in class, um, because I talk to them about their bibliography. Um, so I'll remind them about it in class, and then I'll write them feedback on it. The challenge is when they want to write about someone living that, uh, you know, like an important female physicist that's alive today. And they can cite her, her journal publications, but there, there isn't, um, besides like that person's university website, maybe there's not a lot available about their their personal life or and and so like sometimes there's interviews maybe they've been interviewed in a magazine or something so that when they want to write about a living person sometimes that's a little bit more challenging um, and in general I try to be as flexible as I can because I, I want them to like what they're doing and I find that the quality is generally better if it's something they're interested in so if it's like a physics major who wants to write about a physicist, I try to make it work for them. But sometimes that means being like a little bit flexible. Um, so I'm not the hardest grader with this assignment. And you know, sometimes they really um, do an awesome job and get an A plus. And then you know, sometimes I'm like, well, you know what? If nothing else, they, someone can now read about this physicist and see their publications. and. Um, that that's good. So, great. And I know that you had um, a student wrote about Elaine Lustig Cohen, who's a graphic designer. Right. Yes. We have her collection here in the graphic design archives, and um, the student worked in the library. So I've heard since then that she really enjoyed the assignment, and that um, Elaine Lustig Cohen was alive at the time. I think she's passed since then, um, but was also really excited about her entry. You know, becoming this nice robust entry. So. That was, although it's challenging with um, living individuals, that's one of the benefits. One thing is you can't use the individual as your source of information. I don't know if anyone ever saw the show Newsroom on HBO. There's actually a scene in that where the one character is really upset that Wikipedia says she went to, I don't know, Cambridge and she went to Oxford or vice versa. And um, they wouldn't accept it as a source because it was coming from her. So um, that's <laughs> just... <laughs> In yeah, <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Um, I opened up this tab on when we did the edit-a-thon. We had a guide specifically for that. It's a lot of the same materials that were on the other guide, but um, somebody had put together kind of other tasks you can do on here, and these links are on the PowerPoint, which I will give to Michael to send out um, for you. But there's things where, um, for example, with the women's topics, if you click on here, there's other categories of things. Um, so, you know, if people are looking for entries that already exist on, you know, women artists, they can click here and then see those and go through and identify someone. Because sometimes the hardest thing is finding an entry that needs help. Um, I know in trying to get practice, I took American National Biography and just started randomly picking articles and seeing, and half of them were already really nice and robust, um, which was nice to see, but it was a little challenging to find someone who needed the assistance. Um, and then there's another option here of things that somebody could do on Wikipedia, like um, this site has been compiled by somebody. It's not the fanciest looking, 
but it has things like um, this just needs the code needs to be cleaned up this needs to be copy edited um, and you could go through the list but maybe there's other tasks like I said it doesn't have to be creating a new entry there might be other things that you think oh this is the type of thing my students could do like if it was um, you know maybe in a writing class the context of going in and copy editing just to right. practice that process um, is yeah, possible. I think the important thing is to think about what are your goals for learning outcomes in the class and then it, what you know if there's a way in which Wikipedia engaging with Wikipedia would help you reach those goals um, Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that, that um, thanks to this edit-a-thon, a lot of the librarians are now pretty good with the Wikipedia editing. So if you're interested, I see a lot of COLA faculty, so feel free to reach out to me. But if you're in another college and you uh, are interested in doing a, an assignment, reach out to your librarian. Kari Horowitz, the CIAS librarian, um, helped organize that edit-a-thon, and she's really good with it as well as many of the others. So there is support for your students if you're you know, hesitant yourself about the editing part. And student workers got trained too. So, you know, so there, if your students just come up to the circulation desk, there's likely to be someone who could help them with the technical aspects. So we're really lucky. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.